This is Nick Black in Beverly Hills and I'm talking to filmmaker and actor Paul Bartell and I'm just interrupting Paul's dinner and he's graciously agreed to talk to us. So, Paul, thank you very much. Not at all, Nick. Firstly, Paul, where are you from and how did you get started in the film industry? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I grew up across the Hudson River in New Jersey. I had a very standard 50s education, but I've always been interested in films since I was very, very young. And in the beginning, I was interested in animation. I thought I wanted to be an animation director. And I made a couple of animated films, one when I was in high school. Actually, I chose to go to university at UCLA out here in Los Angeles, across the country from where I'd grown up, because they had a good animation department. But after I got out here and became active in the theater and film department, I realized I was more interested in live action animation. And also, in the late 50s, it was getting harder and harder to do anything really interesting in animation. The golden period of innovative stylistic animation was coming to an end, not to be revived until the 80s. So I got very active in theater and started acting in people's films and thinking about directing a film myself. And when I graduated, I got a Fulbright scholarship and went to Italy. Studied film there for a year and made my first live action short there. Why Italy, Paul? Did you choose Italy? Uh, Yes, I chose Italy because I liked what was happening there in terms of film. I'd studied French for many years, but I realized that I was more interested in Italian cinema, and so I switched to Italian and got a scholarship. And I went to the Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia. It was very interesting. I had a great time. Did you have any famous teachers? Bertolucci was there when I was there. There weren't any teachers at the school whose names would mean anything, but all the big directors came with their new films, often in rough cut, and showed them and discussed them. That was exciting. I I remember seeing René Clair's last film at the school, which was an Italian co-production. That whole Italian experience changed my orientation somewhat. I came back to the States. I was in the Army for a couple of years where I made documentaries and training films. Got out of the Army, went to work for a company that made TV commercials. But I worked for them in the capacity of production manager. I really wasn't very interested in being a production manager. I wanted to direct. So I used their facilities and made another short of my own called The Secret Cinema, which was shown in a lot of film festivals. And years later, I was invited by Steven Spielberg to remake it in color on a million dollar budget for his television series of amazing stories. That's pretty much how I got involved. Just going back, what did your parents or family think of you sort of traipsing over to California and and going over to Italy in a field that is not very steady for employment purposes? Well, my father had always had ambitions to be a writer or to write for the theater and because of the depression, he had had to go to work in advertising which was a related field but very far afield in a way. And I think that he was very pleased that I was able to have a kind of career that he would have liked to have himself. Eventually when my film Eating Raoul was shown at the New York Film Festival, I think he was very proud. My parents have always been very supportive. They financed most of Eating Raoul, got all their money back and made quite a nice profit on it. So it was a wise decision to invest with their son. Yes, although it isn't always a wise decision. It's always a dangerous thing to do, but we were very lucky in that case. It worked out. Tell us, Paul, a little bit about the background of your first feature, Private Parts. You told me you did it for Roger Corman's brother, Gene. How did it all come about? I had been working on documentaries for the U.S. Information Agency. My film, The Secret Cinema, was being shown at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro, where I was working on a documentary. And the guy who was in charge of motion pictures for the American Embassy in Rio organized a big dinner party in my honor because of secret cinema being shown down there. And he invited all the young filmmakers and playwrights in Rio. It was a a wonderful occasion, but in the middle of the party it occurred to me that these guys were much younger than I was and they were already making feature films and that the documentaries that I was working on were never going to lead to making feature films. I had to stop doing that and start concentrating on trying to get feature films. So when I got back to New York I made another little short using the facilities of the company that I was working for called Naughty Nurse. Then I started looking around started writing some stuff myself. I was involved with Brian De Palma 
little bit. I appeared in briefly in Hi Mom, his film. Then Brian De Palma's producer brought me a script, which he ultimately did not produce himself, but which I optioned and rewrote. An agent who was a friend of mine sent it to Gene Corman, who came to New York and looked at my shorts and agreed that I could direct it. At the time, Gene Corman was producing a series of low-budget, mostly black exploitation films for MGM. This became one of that series. How was directing your first feature? Well, I was very lucky because Gene had a very good organization built up. The set designer was wonderful, but my cameraman was Andrew Davis, now a very successful director in his own right. He had shot several pictures for Gene. Gene had promised him that he could direct the next one, but the next one was mine and I was attached to it, and he was, I think, very resentful that I was directing and not he. So he gave me a hard time on several occasions, but it was probably good for me that somebody was giving me a hard time and challenging me and pushing against me. Yeah, so has Andrew Davis ever asked you to be acting one of his films? <laughs> no, he hasn't. It went fairly successfully private party and Gene was pretty happy with the result? No, it wasn't successful. The title when we were shooting it was Blood Relations, but the president of MGM, who was at that time Jim Aubrey, retitled it Private Parts, which was a title that wasn't printable in a lot of newspapers. In Chicago it was Private Party, and in Boston I think it was Private Arts. The film was a tactical error on my part because it was a very sophisticated, kinky film, and hard Horror films, per se, have to play to basically kids' audiences. And it wasn't designed for kids at all. It had an R rating. So it fell between stools, and it never did very well commercially, although it did get some very good reviews. Your next film was Death Race 2000? I directed a second unit for Roger Corman of a film called Big Bad Mama. And because my job consisted mainly of doing stunts with cars, Roger gave me Death Race 2000 to direct. And I actually wrote a fairly good portion of the final script too, although I was denied screen credit, probably because I wasn't a member of the Writers Guild yet. The basic idea was already there and you just expanded on it? Yes, we worked on it for a year before we actually shot it. And during that year, the idea changed quite a lot. Well, it's what I would term a cult classic and has had a very long life and it's still enjoyed today. What do you think the reason is, Paul? I mean, there's a lot of mayhem and stuff like that going on and the reason for its longevity? First and foremost, because it hooks into a very popular fantasy about deliberately running people over for sport and getting points. But apart from that, I think it's full of surprises, it's imaginative, and it's funny. And I think probably the fact that it's funny is what's mostly responsible for its success. At least I hope so. Tell me, who thought up the point system? Because I remember distinctly that if you hit a baby, you got more points than an adult. That was the premise of the original short story by Ib Melchior, I believe. And Chuck Griffith elaborated on that in his version of the script. Was it a fun film to do or was it difficult, you know, having all the cars and stunts and all that sort of stuff? Logistically, I assume it would have been fairly difficult. It was difficult. We didn't have enough time and I was inexperienced with shooting action and I think I didn't do as good a job with the action sequences as I might have. But again, Roger gave me very good support. I had a terrific AD and the sets were very imaginatively and beautifully done. But I think it made up in imagination what it lacked in technical excellence. The cars that we were working with could hardly go over 40 miles an hour so we had to create the illusion of speed by undercranking. And it's a very cartoony film in many ways, but that's part of its charm. Well, were there any hair-raising accidents on set? Because I imagine it would have been fairly dangerous as well, even though the cars were only going 40 miles an hour. No, there were no accidents. The most difficult aspect of it was that Roger, as producer, kept changing his mind about what kind of movie he wanted it to be. He vacillated between its being a hard action movie and its being a black comedy. That made it very difficult. And in the final editing process, he viscerated several of the gags because he thought that they detracted from the serious nature of the film. But, all's well that ends well, it was very successful and certainly launched my career. Also, you've been doing acting as well, and you've been doing it for a long time, and I remember a cute little movie called Rock and Roll High School with Mary Warrenoff. Warrenoff. <laughs> so, you've kept up 
the acting as well consistently and do you enjoy that as much as directing? Well I enjoy it very much it's different from directing ideally I'd love to do a little more directing but while I'm waiting for someone to come along and finance one of the several projects that I'm trying to get off the ground including a sequel to Eating Raul by the way I get a great deal of pleasure out of acting and I seem to get invited to uh, participate in a great many first films and independent films and experimental films I just worked in a very interesting film it was shot in upstate New York about a serial killer of animals in a community where many of the local residents are deeply emotionally involved with their pets. I don't want to get into that one. The fact that you're working with perhaps newer directors and all that, and obviously I assume that they would be very enthusiastic, does that sort of renew your vigor as well, Paul? I would say it keeps me going. Yes, it's fun. I've had a chance to work in some very interesting and distinguished pictures. I was in Basquiat. I had a nice little scene in The Usual Suspects. I had a very brief appearance in Escape from L.A. I do work in all kinds of things. I did a brief foray into television again. I directed a couple of episodes of Clueless, the TV series based on the movie. And I even played the high school principal in one show. How is directing for TV, Paul? Do you enjoy it as much as a feature? Well, it's not as much fun as making features, especially when they're your own idea. Although I was sort of filled with trepidation about whether at my age I could still keep up the pace of a TV show. I found it was perfectly easy. It was a wonderful crew and they were very fast and supportive and it all worked out beautifully. I want to get on to your film Not for Publication which was sort of a, a homage to the screwball comedies of the 30s. It was a project that I had worked on for several years that I wanted to do for a long time and I think now where there are parts of it that are just very badly directed and the plot is too complicated and really it should have been a musical. It should have had a lot of songs and that were I to do it again I would put in five more songs at least. <laughs> I want to get on to uh, Lust in the Dust featuring Divine. Uh, Divine was mostly associated with John Waters. Uh, how did you come to cast Divine and Tab Hunter, which was the casting of Polyester, which was roughly released around the same time? Tab was the producer of Lust in the Dust. He had developed the script, and he had originally intended it to be a serious film. But after John Waters cast him in Polyester, I think he changed his whole idea. And he wanted to cast a lot of John's actors in the film, and I told him that if I were directing it, that I didn't really want to make a John Waters film without John. I mean, if you wanted to go that way, you should hire John. I had something somewhat different in mind. Again, you know, I made a, a tactical error on that film, too. I tried to rein in the comedy and make it a little less outrageous hoping for a wider audience. Whereas what I should have done is, you know, really push the limits. Although I think in terms of when the film was made, it might have been three or four years too early to make as outrageous a movie as one could have made out of it. But the thing that I really regret about that film is that it was shot in Super Technoscope, and the intention was that it should look like a Sergio Leone movie in widescreen. We designed a lot of shots to be very Leone-esque, there were big close-ups of eyes and guns and whatnot. And at the very last minute, Tab, as producer, abandoned the whole anamorphic format because the laboratory we were using was having a hard time getting the color right. And it was easier just to go for 185. But it lost a lot of the stylization that we had very carefully planned. We did make one anamorphic answer print in which the color wasn't very good, but it was in scope. And I eventually inherited that print and gave it to the Museum of Modern Art. And I am hoping that the people who now have the video rights to the film might use that print and electronically correct the color and make a DVD of the letterboxed version. Eating Rayol, which was a huge hit in Australia and probably the biggest box office success ever featuring cannibalism. Would that be correct? Well, Eating Raoul isn't about cannibalism. Cannibalism actually only, the title notwithstanding, only enters into the picture in the last minute and a half, I would say. It's really not a cannibal movie, but it does seem to be the film that I have made that has connected best with the audience, and I have written, Dick Blackburn and I, I should say, have written a sequel to it, which I am hoping may get produced one of these days. How hard is it to direct yourself? Were you following your direction or, I mean, or is it hard to judge be objective about your own performance? Well, I do rely on the cameraman and the assistant and various 
members of the support team to let me know if I've made any serious mistakes. But after a while, you get to feel you know how to, to scale things and have the feel of your own performance and know if it's all right or not. Do you have a title for Eating Rail? Would it be Eating Rail 2? Well, it probably will have to be Eating Rail 2 just in order to establish it as a sequel, although the subtitle is Bland Ambition. <laughs> I want to get on to another really interesting film, Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Paul? Again, that was a project that was a long time in the development. It was an idea that I had, but I didn't seem to be able to write it by myself, and I tried with a couple of different writers, and finally I got together with a writer named Bruce Wagner. It's his script that we ultimately used, although the story was developed by the two of us. Bruce has gone on to write a couple of novels and has actually just directed his own film called I'm Losing You, based on his most recent novel. So I feel a little bit responsible for launching his career. I'm very fond of scenes from the class struggle. It has a couple of sequences in which there's no dialogue, just action and music. And although the distributor fought me tooth and nail about those scenes at the time, they are among my favorite sequences in all of the films that I've made. And also it has a great cast. When the financier distributors finally gave us the go-ahead, we just went for the best actors we could get. There were some actors we wanted that we didn't get, but I think we were very lucky with the ones we did get, and some of them were old friends from Eating Raoul, like Ed Begley Jr., for instance, and Wally Shawn was an old friend. That was one of the pleasantest shooting experiences I've ever had. It was very low pressure. The producer, Jim Katz, made sure that everything went very smoothly and easily. We had no problems on it at all. Was that an actual house, Paul, or was it a soundstage? Because it looked very realistic. No, it was all shot on location in an actual house in Hancock Park. Not in Beverly Hills? No, not in Beverly It's too expensive to shoot in Beverly Hills because they charge an outrageous amount for permit. But there are lots of parts of Los Angeles that look like Beverly Hills. I think we may have stolen some exterior shots in Beverly Hills. We're running out of time, but I just quickly want to mention that you did the long shot with Pim Conway and a film called Shelf Life. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Shelf Life is a film that I made and financed myself. It was based on a play that was written by three actors who were also the performers in the play. And when I saw it, Little Theatre on Melrose Avenue here in Los Angeles, I thought it would make a wonderful little sort of underground film. It's about three children who have grown up in a fallout shelter. The premise is very similar, in fact, to Blast from the Past, except that they never leave. These actors used the premise for the basis of a series of sketches that are ostensibly about the life of these people underground, but really satires on different aspects of American life. I'm extremely proud of it. I think it's a wonderful little film, and one day some critic with clout will discover it, and it will have a life. A shelf life. All right then, Paul, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us and interrupting your dinner. I want to wish you all the best with Eating Rail 2, Bland Ambition. Paul Bartel, thank you very much for talking to us. You're most welcome, Nick.